Yes, guys, we're live. Welcome back to S Feetly TV. Right. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, welcome back. I'm sorry, I've been busy trying to research today because we're starting a new show today. A new show, new show series. Right, it's called F1 Legends. Basically, it's a new weekly show that we're going to do, and we're going to go through the legends of F1. We've got team principles, mechanics, um, the pioneers of safety, like, it's like Sid Watkins, all that. Drivers as well, obviously. It's maybe even mention some of the great teams as well, so I'm a bit out of breath. <laughs> I'm running around like a man, man. Uh, but we are live. Sorry I was late, but yeah, just had to finish off some research on our first topic. So, first topic is about um, one Manuel Fangio, the godfather himself of Formula One. Um, next week, we're doing Giuseppe Farina as well, actually, because he is the first ever world champion. It's not actually one of Fangio, as some people might think back in the 50s. But, yeah, he's obviously one of the pioneers of Formula One, was there from the start. Uh, with um, the first ever Grand Prix at Silverstone in 1950. So, yeah, we're just going to go through his career, through about his life. So, yeah, he was born on the 24th of June, 1911. Um, were born in Argentina, but he's from Italian descent. His grandfather moved to, uh, emigrated to Argentina in 1887, bought a farm there. Um, they called it, uh, they was born on what they call San Juan's Day, which is celebrating the birth of John the Baptist, apparently. Uh, became known as also in child, childhood as the El Chueco, uh, or the El Maestro, as we would say in English, because apparently he was very good at football. He was very good at bending the ball, like bending it like Beckham. So, uh, yeah, maybe Arsenal should have signed him up. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but uh, 13... Throughout school, he was he dropped out of education to go study automobile and mechanics uh, and stuff like that. And uh, but then at sixteen, obviously started riding motorcycles and cars for uh, employers, customers. Uh, and yeah, um, yeah, just get your questions in, get your comments in as well. Uh, was enlisted in the military uh, at twenty one, and then obviously he's driving skills caught attention back in uh his military compulsory military service um and his actual commanding officer made him his personal driver um but yeah and then after a final physical examination um he was then uh he then was discharged from the from the military, and returned home to even wasn't actually looking to further his F uh, his, his not F one wasn't around in the twenties and thirties, but his racing career because obviously Grand Prix was still happening. But yeah, he oh my hair's a mess. It's a mess, man. It's honestly. Uh, need to sort it out, but um, yeah, yeah, as I was saying, he he wanted to go back and further his own football career. Uh, but his team, he the team he played for, uh, their his teammates recommended that him and his friend, uh, who's Jose Duarford, uh, went and go and build their own cars uh, as a hobby which his parents gave him the space to in their own shed. Uh, but, yeah, and that's sort of really how his interest in the cars got really going. Um, uh, and then after his military service, he began racing. His racing really started doing local events, got really good at them. Then his racing career sort of started in Argentina in 1936, driving a 1929 Ford Model A that, he rebuilt himself. Um, it was the first race he participated in, in a tourism highway category, uh, and was the Argentine national champion in 1940-41. Uh, obviously, while the war was going on, 
uh, then was racing was suspended even in, in his country because uh, of the war. Uh, after the war in about 1948, uh, he returned to racing after 1946, so after the war. In 1948, suffered a personal tra tra tragedy in a grueling race, uh, which was a 20-day 20, 20 racing event. And on the 10th day, driving in thick fog, uh, he's obviously doing what they call rallying, but a sort of thing back then. And... By the way, get your comments in, get your questions in while you're watching this. Uh, get people in. Share it on Twitter, share it on Instagram, share it on Facebook. Get people in, get people on. This is sort of giving you a sort of idea of the history of this sport. But, yeah, but and he was drove through too fast into a corner, lost control, went down into embankment. He was physically injured neck, with his neck injuries, but a driver was actually flew out the car. Uh, Ruita, uh, Ruitia, uh, and he was killed right along with that. Uh, I think three spectators as well. Uh, I think actually the whole race event, three spectators and three drivers died uh, during that event, which yeah was not obviously nice. His first ever Grand Prix was then later on in that year in 1948 at the French Grand Prix at Reims, but obviously. Everyone knows him for F1. He was the f one of the first competitors in Formula One, starting at the first race in 1950 at this uh, the British Grand Prix, or the no the the Grand Prix de Europe as they called it, the European Grand Prix actually they called it, um, not the British one, uh, but it was held at Silverstone, and um, yeah, but. Um, Though starting, obviously, in Formula 1, he was considered one of the eldest in in, in the new formula. Um, so, 1915, what was 1911, so he's already about 39 already, so pushing on 40, which in today's age for Formula 1, that's re that's nearly retirement age. It's about the age of Michael Schumacher and Kimi Räikkönen now. Well, Kimi Räikkönen now is he's approaching his retirement. Um, but um, yeah, took part in an inaugural race for what was known as the Alpha. It was the Alpha Romeo team uh, with the Alfetta um, uh, one five eight, the red Alf Alpha Alfetta one five eight, which was the powerhouse was the car at that time, uh, which was basic in its design really, but it just had a mighty engine under it. Uh, and it finished, it would have finished the one, two, three, four, but because they used four drivers, they were going to use three, but because of the British Grand Prix, they let uh, a British race. Oh, who's the British racing driver who competed in that? Oh, who competed in that? I'd have to look it up. See, I'm already looking it up. Can't remember because I remember watching it back. Uh, 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 right, British Grand Prix, 1950. British Grand Prix. Come on, I'm good day. It's always his way. Um, ah, Rick Parnell. Yeah, Rick Parnell. Um, and yeah, then. Obviously, he won his five titles, and these cars, they were very demanding. Um, the, the clutch was really hard to use. The, 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 the steering wheel was very heavy. Um, uh, the tyres were thin. Um, so, uh, no traction control, no electronic aids at that time. It was just basically... Um, yeah, apologies for that. Um, yeah, it really is. Um, it was just basically a bunch of tubes all put together around four wheels. <laughs> it wasn't anything like the great technology that we have these days. I mean, I could show you an image of the Alpha. Uh, uh, the, 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 I think it was the Alpha 158. Uh, Uh, 
All right, just gonna show you this picture. I'm gonna show you a picture of this is yeah, good discussion. This is great. Um, I don't know where uh talk money, I'll give you the link if you want to come. Miss Mel, if you want to come on to join this discussion, you can do. I'll send you the link if you want me to. Uh I did send the link to Bargav, but again, I don't know where he's got to. Uh Chris Paul, I gave him the link. I don't know where he's got to. Um I don't get it. Uh, but yeah, here's this was the car of the time, the 158. It's so simple and it's this design, right? Uh, front engine, not rear. Tires were thin, grooved, deep cut, grooved. No technology, but very basic. Uh, it was built in basic, though it was raced in 1950, it was reminded of the car of the time, but because of the war, there was no development really. And this was back, it was built in 1937. It's, I mean, you look at that, and then, um, and I'll show you what just, just keep that in your mind. So you've got those cars of today and then 2020. Then you've got these. That's like how much it's changed in 70, 70 years, which is just incredible. Um, but yeah, I uh, don't want to say too much on that. But um, yeah, his first title came the year after the, uh, the inaugural season, uh, which was won by Giuseppe Farina, um, which was the only title he won, actually. The, um, the next one uh, was won by him in the Alfa in that Alfa Romeo that you saw there, um, beating Farina and his basically it, the Alfa Romeo that Alfa Romeo Alfa uh, until someone came with a better car and a bigger engine because back then it was just about how big the engine was, how much output you can put, get out of the engine, and. Um, until someone realized the first sort of development was one by Cooper because by the end of the year, they Cooper realized by 1959 they built a car. They realized if you put the front engine at the back, you get better handling, you get better steering. The, tur the car turns into the corner, so uh, rather than if you've got something at the front of the car, if you've got all the way at the front, the car will just go uh, like that, it just won't turn, you won't turn in. Because uh, it's got too much weight, so uh, so they put it at the back, and you see now cars, F1 cars are always rear engined, but um, yeah, so they until that came along, uh, until the next sort of big engine car came along, this was the powerhouse back of the that was the Mercedes of that those three four years, so it was him competing with his teammates and. Back then, you look at his stats. Um, I mean, his stats show that he had 51, uh, 52 entries, but 51 race starts. So you enter a Grand Prix, but it, you, you, but you enter a Grand Prix weekend, but it starts means you start the actual race. But he had 51 starts to the race. He had um, 29 pole positions. 23 fastest laps, 35 podiums, and uh, won 24 of those 51 starts, which is around about half. So, yeah, it's it's just under half. But the thing is, is that he raced in times where you had about eight, nine races per season. You didn't have the 23 races that we have now, right? which now means you can have 
break records like Schumacher's. Right? I mean, even Schumacher only weighs 16 races. Now you've got 23. So, um, yeah, so the, 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 back then you can't really compare stats his stats to Hamilton's. So you never got the amount of races that Hamilton gets. So um, the only thing you could compare it on is the number of titles. So different times, different times. And even then, you could say those titles were one in cars that are so much more demanding. So, uh, but then you can also say it's also demanding modern day cars because modern day cars go much starts so much faster, which means so much more force is put on the on the driver. So it means they have to train even more. So yeah um obviously uh won that first championship in 51 52 he had a serious uh crash uh after uh doing one race then flying back but missing the connection flight which then meant he had to fly back straight away which means that um uh uh i heard that F1 is going to try 18 inch tires with this race, which will will this improve his race? They're gonna try no, they can't use 18 tire inch tires during the season during this season. You can't. Like the rules already say they use the tires that they're given. The 18 inch tires are for next season. Next season they're using 18 18 inch wins, right? So it's not Hamilton getting his own 18-inch wheels, right, for this season. No, he's trying them out in a practice session, or um, or practicing it in a in a in their own test day to show the FIA if it works, and also to help the teams get some information about the sort of tires that and the sort of grip levels they're going to be using in their forthcoming season. So. You won't be doing that. Um, I might. We well, we we are going to be talking about next season. We are, yeah. We know. Uh, so this has already been planned for the new rules in twenty twenty one. This is what we're going to be talking about in the checker flag show next week. Nick, checker flag show next week. If everyone tunes in with DNF one podcast yet again, DNF one podcast will be coming back on this week. We will be talking about the new regulations. So we'll be going through all of that. All those eight, all that tests of eighteen inch wins, everything like that. We'll be going through that because we're going through the whole regulations. So, yeah. So, yeah. That's just to, for next season. That's not for this season. So, um. But back to back to this. Um, had a massive accident in fifty two, which meant with his injuries, he got a massive neck injury. So he had to um rest for the rest of that season. So that one was a write off. Um, the rest was a write off. That that one was a write off. So, yeah. So, um, 1953 was where he managed to get back uh, to full fitness to be able to race for Maserati again. Rejoin them because of I forgot to say that after he won that championship with 51 with for Alpha, he moved to Maserati in 52. Um, and was doing well in that season, then had that massive accident. Then rejoined Mr. Maserati in 53 for another season, but the Ferraris were dominant in that season and was led by the famous uh, Alberto Rascari, uh, hence why you've got one of the circuit corners at Monza named Tascari, um, uh, who was uh, a legend himself. Uh, I think he won the championship, didn't he? He won the championship, didn't he? Uh, list of F1 champions. Uh, yeah, he won it in Alf. He won it in 52 and 53 because they had... Because... Uh, Alpha had that dominant season with that 158. Then Ferrari immediately be able to produce uh, the yeah yeah he managed to they managed to uh, produce a much better Ferrari than the one they had before. 
And everyone says they were there from the start, which is true. They were there from the start for Ari, but they never competed in the first race. Right? He, they never got clearance with the BRDC, the British Ry Racing Drivers Club, in time for them to be able to compete at the first Grand Prix. So people might think, okay, they look back at the footage of the British, British Grand Prix. Yes, it's all black and white, but we, so we can't tell what the colours are. And we're like, hang on, where were the Ferrari? And by the way, back then, Ferrari were not red. They were yellow because the Ralph and Mayos were red. So they were yellow because of their badge were yellow. So that's the, the, the original colour. If you anyone that knows sport, uh, motorsport, will know Ferrari's original colour is yellow. It's not black, it's not red. Right. They took on red after after Alfa Romeo retired. Um, but it's all their original color was yellow. But um, yeah, uh, Maserat. Uh, he joined Maserat in fifth. Uh, but I've gone a bit wayward here, so I've gone a bit all over the place. But yeah, so Ferrari dominated fifty two after. Um, Alpha Mayo pulled out. That's what I remember. Uh, that, that's what uh, I can remember reading is that Alpha Mayo after 51, they pulled out the sport, which meant Alf, uh, um, Fangio was like, okay, what do I find a drive? Um, went to Maserati, had that accident, came back, went to uh, full fitness again, competed with the Ferraris who were dominant in that, se in that uh, season, in that season again. And Ascari claiming a back-to-back -back world championship. Um, and, yeah, uh, was the first actual, I think he was the first, or the, yeah, he was the first back-to-back -back world champion. So the first driver to win it back-to-back. -back. So, uh, and then, uh, but despite the Ferraris being dominant, Fangio managed to finish second in the championship, which shows the talent. Uh, 1953, um was uh yeah so not, that was 1953 uh this is also why he won such races in other sports car championship races because f1 drivers didn't just do f1 like they do now because of the congestion of the fixtures because like you've got nine races over a season to keep the circus going and this was what happened in the 60s as well, not so much in the 70s, but the 60s, definitely, because there were not that many races. So what they did is that they were constantly um, doing F2 races, support races. They were doing uh, sports car races to keep the circus going, keep it on the move, keep it that, that sort of sort of like a like being on, like on a world concert tour, keep it moving. Uh, so he won the Milia, uh, Mille, uh, Miglia, um, two heats of the Alibi Grand Prix, which weren't on the calendar, and then Panam, uh, Panamericana in Mexico. 1954 was then the start of his dominance. He joined Mercedes, and yeah, the Mercedes team uh that gave him an unbelievable car of the 196 streamliner uh if you look back at sky sports they did a piece with hamilton where him and bundle drove the 196 streamliner around silverstone and it's such a beautiful piece of machine it's a long way off for what formula one looks like now like, it looks like more like a sports car than a formula one car uh, I mean, I could show you that one as well. Uh, w196 Streamliner. Show you that. Just stop that screen. I'm going to show you this screen. So, yeah, this. See, that, that was um, Hamilton doing it for Sky Sports, taking it out for a spin. Right. 
the W196 Streamliner. And this was back in a time where not just the cars were demanding. Look, look at the caps. They didn't even have helmets. They had goggles, caps, like something was just like a piece of like car, like keep like a, just something, just like a piece of cloth going over their head. So um, it was yeah, it was just to keep the the, the bugs away. It, it just it was just mad. There was no seat belts as well. It's just those times were mad. And if so, it meant because they preferred back in them days, if you were going to have an accident, they thought it was more safe for you to get flung from the car, right? Rather than actually being strapped like that in a the car, they'd rather you be from from the car, especially if the car caught fire. So, which is just in today's world is unbelievably mad but yeah so they had the 1996 streamliner uh one the french grom uh, uh one is uh i mean yeah he joined that mid-season all right after winning the race after the winning the argentine and belgian grand prix of 19 with the italian team in 1954 he then left them and went to Mercedes. He then won the French Grand Prix at Reims. He dominated it like Hamilton does in his Mercedes today. Dominated it. And uh, battling his teammate, Carl Kling. Uh, I think uh, Sterling Moss was also another teammate. Uh, and then... Yeah, then won at the Nordisch Liefer uh, at Nürburgring, the Italian Grand Prix at Monza, because Nürburgring, they don't have the Grand Prix, so didn't have the Grand Prix circuit that we have our days, the safe Grand Prix circuit, right? If you did the Nürburgring back in them days, you did the Nordisch, the, Nord, the Nordisch Liefer, right? Which is uh, 13.68 miles, something like that, around 128 or so corners to do. <laughs> You took off back in an F1 car. You took off about 13 times. I'm sorry, cars are not meant to fly. <laughs> it was so dangerous. Uh, you couldn't. We, I mean, we talked about it last week on last week's podcast about safety. It doesn't meet the grade. It doesn't mean it meets about the third tier grade because you couldn't marshal it. You couldn't do this. Things would have to be chopped down, made of that. You'd have to build new hospital systems. You'd have to build your own city to look after the damn place and be able to marshal it. It just, it just wouldn't work. It'd need like an army of people to try and look after it. Literally, would have to have the armed forces call in. Um, but yeah, he dominated that uh, after beat, he won the Italian Grand Prix, beating a new young racer, Sterling Moss. Who actually wasn't racing with them at the time? He was racing, I think, with uh, BRM or someone, uh, a British team, I think. Finished with a second world title uh, with 12 wins from eight, which is six Grand Prix of eight in the championship. So basically, like they did two Grand Prix, like, apart from like the Nurburgring, maybe, where it's like one, just one Grand Prix because it's so bloody long. where there's some of them had two Grand Prix, uh, two races in a, in a Grand Prix weekend. So kind of like what they're proposing for the sprint race this season in three events. My guess, I don't think the teams will like it, but there you go. That's my opinion, but that's another debate. 1955, victory and tragedy. Again, he remained with, with, with pair Mercedes another season. And do smash the likes up, please. Please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. If you like this new series already, hit that subscribe button. I'm hoping to get guests on as well. I'm trying to get guests on towards the end to let you have your say right on uh, the, on the on on this as well. Please hit that like button though. Hit that subscribe button. All right, uh, Anthony, I think I did send you the link if you wanted to join. But yeah, anyway, uh, he remained with Mercedes where they fought to the very end with 
team with all his teammates. Kling, Moss, Collins, that streamliner dominated 1955. Unfortunately, um, sorry, I'm just wiping my eyes out, my eyes. Um, tragically, though, uh, 1955 for motorsport was a very dark, dark year for a very one race. If motorsport fans know, uh, they'll know what I'm talking about. But for the ones that don't, 1955, we had the Le Mans 24 hour Grand Prix or race. The Le Mans 24 hours that we know. Um, it was a straight battle between Jaguar and Mercedes. Unfortunately, and this is where ja um, Hawthorne, who was also a world, British world champion, I think he was also the first British ever world champion, I believe. Yeah, Mike Hawthorne, the first ever British world champion, was involved in the actual accident. And some people blame him for the, for the accident. Some people blame someone else. But in the accident, they were coming up to the straight and there was a little kink. There was a back marker in a way of one driver and another driver was trying to overtake the driver who was in front of him who was trying to black the back marker. The back marker was going to pull into the pits. I think. I don't think that's... Hang on, no. What happened was is that the guy in front was going to... Uh, I can, hang on. Sorry, I can remember what happened. Wait. Um, there was a back marker in, in the way and was staying out of the way. The guys behind, one was going to go into to pit, uh, which had no sort of... There was no barriers between the pit area and the race area that we have now, right? And what happened was the guy went off into tried to slow down to go into the pit lane. It caught the other guy off guard. He cut across, hit the uh, back marker, hit the, the 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 bale straws, which basically acted like a ramp. Took the car off, and the car went flying into the spectators, into the stands. It killed over a hundred people. And around about 50, 60 people went in like that. I've just lost their heads like that. They didn't have time to react and duck. They just literally gone. Um, and yeah. Uh, and even then, the race continued afterwards. I think the race was eventually stopped because it was an absolute stream because most accidents that happen like this there's then like seven five years later there was von trips in an f1 accident where seven eight spectators were killed including himself in a massive accident where he was fighting for the title and yet the race continued in those days there was no red flag i don't think it was yellow flags to be honest you just carried on they just accepted it as part of it but um uh do you think Fangio's neck injury affected his performance in 1952? Because nah, nah, nah. I don't think it did, to be honest. Because in other in other seasons, he raced for one team. Mercedes, he raced in one team and dominated. I'm just the season I'm talking about now. Dominated. Fifth Ferrari, dominated. Fought two for nail, but won it. So I don't think I don't think that did, to be honest. I don't think it did. So, um, um, but yeah, um, he never raced at Le Mans again after that, even though they tried to make improvements to the circuit, which didn't really make much improvements, to be honest. But anyway, um, yeah, so he won that season despite that tragedy there at Le Mans uh, for Mercedes. He then left Mercedes to join Ferrari. Um, and and race for Enzo Ferrari, uh, the commentatore. Um, despite managing to achieve his fourth world title with Ferrari, that season, that car was not a very good car. It was very difficult to drive. 
most of the teammates did not very much struggle with that car, um, which sort of showed that he can drive difficult cars. But he was hanging at the start of the season, he was hanging in there in the championship. He then requested for his own personal mechanic to work on the car to make it better. Eventually, Ferrari granted him this request and immediately he improved, picked up pace and started winning races. And by the end of the season, managed to claim the title um, with, I think, about a race or two to spare. Uh, which shows he himself, along with his mechanics, with knew he knew that what problems he needed to fix and what mechanic he needed to fix those problems and who he could trust. S sort of like how Hamilton's been able to come into, for, uh, into Mercedes and work with the team to build the team uh, a better car, a great management system um, that's made them sort of unbeatable for the last what since the turbo hybrid era began which is now seven eight years ago now so which again shows another level of the driver um and this is coming into his last couple of seasons he and we'll talk about his last season his last season i think possessed one of his greatest ever drives in a formula one car ever after giving Ferrari and Italy the title, because if you give Ferrari the title, you give Italy the title. You treat Ferrari's dream, you treat Italy's dream. You race for the country when you race for Ferrari. Right? Even if you race for Ferrari, if, even if you decided to race for another Italian team like like Toro Rosso or Alfa Toro we have now, Alfa Romeo like we have now, or back then, um, uh, Maserati, if you, or Lamborghini, if you race for Ferrari, you race for that country in Formula One. Simple as that. Uh, that's why winning the title and winning a title of Ferrari is going to totally different things. Totally different things. Um, immediately, uh, he left. Yeah, after leaving Ferrari, he went back to his old team, Maserati, who was still using the same car, um, uh, which is the 250th immediately dominated with from the start which shows that for cars back in them days unlike today's cars where they have to build a new car to new regulations every year and also be able to develop have to develop it to make the car better throughout the year these cars didn't change for two or three years now are the cars now change nearly every bloody weekend these cars don't really change so immediately he could take an old car back like that and then immediately started winning races. Three wins on the spin. Retired, unfortunately retired in the British Grand Prix, which is race four. Uh, then went on to win the 24-hour uh, um, uh, or uh, the 24-hour uh, to bring sports car race in the Maserati's 450s with John Bear as his teammate. Um, I'm trying to think. And he did that for a second year in a row, actually. He did not. He did that also in 1956. He also did that in 57. So he's proving his talents in multiple formulas. Uh, but... The, the last thing was his greatest ever achievement was the German Grand Prix that season. He went to Germany. He had to win the championship. If he won it by another six points, he extended his, his, his gap by another six points to his nearest rivals, he'd win the championship. Got pole position for this Nürburgring. And don't forget, this is at the Nürburgring, the Lord of By lap, uh, by, uh, by the end of the first lap, he was dropped down a third. But I managed to get back first place by end of lap three. Now, by lap 13, is literally like halfway distance. They only did about 26 laps because it's that long. But they did lap, they did Grand Prix that literally low, uh, lasted about two hours and maybe a bit over that. That's how long they lasted. Not like now where they have only a two-hour window to get a, 
they have a four hour window to get a maximum two hour race, but only last about an hour and 40 minutes. These lasted two hours, done. But yeah, he had a, he thinking he needed new tires because these tires weren't going to last the whole race. They half filled him with fuel. So by lap 13, he needed to come in for more fuel. So they pitted him with a 30 second gap thinking, okay, all right, new tyres and this. He'll catch them up. He'll overtake them. Job done. But that pit stop turned into a, to a disaster. Right? Struggling to get the tyres on. Struggling with the refuelling. Because uh, don't forget, also, these refuelling weren't like safe rigs like you saw back in the two, like last time we had refuelled in 2009. Right? Where the fuel only go in once it, you put it into the noz nozzle and connect the nozzle straight in. Right, these were left in massive buckets. Right, so if a car went off and into the wall, right, the whole fucking pit lane would catch on fire. These were left in like buckets, not safety massive hoses and stuff like that. Right, and safe containers. Um, but I mean, refueling though to get has been on and off Formula One for ages. It's been there from there you go. Um, but um. Uh, yeah, a disastrous pit stop for him 30 seconds behind. He left him behind Collins and Hawthorne, who he was fighting a title with. And he had to 50 seconds, I think, with about half the race to catch him up, or something like that. But he was going to be on fresh tyres and fuel, but it was a tall order. Uh, I mean, usually nowadays, if someone's 50 seconds with half the race to go, even with fresh tyres and fuel, they're like, nah, it's not going to work. Uh, no matter who you are, even if you are Lewis Hamilton. But this is where he came into his own, and this is more like a Schumacher-esque, what I used to see as a kid. Right? He would, he was breaking the record nearly every lap 20 times. He broke the record for about a record 20 times in that race. Right? Lap after lap, fastest uh, new lap record, new lap record, new lap record, reeling these guys in. Right? With literally by the penultimate lap with with then by not just the penultimate but the, the lap before the penultimate lap he had reeled these guys in and then by the penultimate lap had got it by the end of the penultimate lap got in front of them got in front of Collins right I mean with a lap to go after that lap had finished and he won the Grand Prix he had three seconds to spare right to win the Grand Prix and claim his fifth title with Maserati, the team he didn't manage to do it with the first time, which was just showing how great of a man he was. But um, I mean, yeah, uh, I think I even missed, maybe I've missed a bit about, yeah, for example, to show the respect that man had, um, I'll bring you in a minute, just a minute, talk to you. Uh, his challenger teammate, Collins, even handed it in 1956, handed his car over with 15 laps to go so he could win the title. Though, he was in a championship winning position. This guy was such a gentleman. He was the sort of guy you wanted to show how Formula One was, right? How Formula One should be. He was a proper sportsman. All right, talk man, you? You know, just been listening, man. Just been doing some stuff in the background. But, um, yeah, great knowledge and stuff. We'll just check your email, mate. Um, yeah, it's really interesting about the early days of it because obviously I'm not a, uh, a fan like yourself, really. Um, what is the fit? Some of it I've had, I, I, I know a majority of it, but some of it obviously you do have to look up because obviously it's, this is about a time before. Oh, I'm on this call. One time. So Uh, 
Mm. Well, that sounds uh, all, it's all very interesting and stuff, mate. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm just gonna get the uh, I'm just gonna get that email, mate. But yeah, and I mean, I know a majority of it, but um, oh, hang on, do I download all of these? Yeah, but see if you put the F1 on, put the F1 one on. on. Oh, oh, give me a minute, I've got to download it first. Um, but uh. I'll be, I think that what will interest me is when you get to the kind of like uh, Nigel Mansell, because I remember that. I remember Nigel oh, Mansell. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, this is probably just where I wanted to start. I mean, I was oh, yeah, you've to got think about that, doing, I mean, like next week, I was thinking about doing Giuseppe Farina because obviously he's like the first ever champion. Mm. But then we could easily just worry about that another time. And like, I want to try and not do drivers all the damn time it's like just maybe do a one on enzo ferrari do one on ron dennis uh one on uh um uh uh uh, uh, uh charlie whiting for example or andrew nui there's so many names you could you could pick out in Formula One and say, yeah, you could talk about him for an hour because mm. the amount of influence he's had on the sport. All oh, these major names. Realize. Don't, 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 sorry, don't download those ones. Oh, you're joking. I no. just did. Yeah, but they're only, they're only tiny, so don't just, it's cool. Just hang quiet for a second. But uh, yeah, uh, continue and I'll. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna open the lines up anyway, and then if people want to come on and have their say on the man himself, they can do. But um, I mean, obviously, uh, it's a great place to start is Fangio. He's obviously the first multiple world champion. Well, he was no, the first was the first. He was the second uh, multiple champion after Ascari. But uh, he was at the 50s, the one they all looked to. And the way he did, went about his racing as well um, was such class and swaggering um, decent and sportsmanship uh, mm. within the man is that why Sterling Moss even let him through at one point to win a race. Though he was being tip to win the title it just shows like the level of respect everyone had for him and um i think that was even no was it was it sterling moss that did that no i think it wasn't that i think i think frangio did it for him because i couldn't find it anywhere where because i remember him uh, um sterling moss mentioning it and i can't remember where i seen it well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, sportsmanship and everything else, that's, that's a great thing. I mean, you're doing great it in thing. cars like this. But, I mean, wow. these cars were, they weren't fucking easy to drive. No, no power steering. No power no steering. No power steering. The, the, the heavy clutch was heavy. The gear stick was heavy. I, sometimes the, the, the drivers would have hands, their blood coming out of their hands. After doing two hours, two hours straight of racing in these things, where you've got these today's cars, mm. um, look at the difference. It, you, yeah. you would, if you look at them and look at how it is, like, um, yeah, if you look at them and you now look at what it is, what it was fifty years, seventy years ago, you wouldn't believe that these cars would be like they were uh 70 years ago as simple as that mm. yeah my mother uh definitely come along the way up yeah and this is apparently we're going to be talking about this next year uh, we're going to be talking about this next week about the new regulations mm. and this is sort of an image of what the f1 car will look like 
as that's what we'll be talking about with dnf1 so we'll be going into that in very much detail sort of looking at the benefits uh, the, the the downsides to it the downsides i think is definitely it's going to be slower uh than the cars of before mm. which does wind me up a bit because like yeah but you can still we just got back still, uh... to a pace we've gone back to a pace that they should be going at they can always uh, make them once they've got the, the the safety aspects right they'll always they can work on the speed i think aspects. it's not just yeah i don't think it's the safe i think part of it is the safety aspect because the reason they've done it is because now you, the, the, if you look at the cars now i mean we can go back like now if you see the cars now look at like if i just showed you a picture of the front of the car look at all these little bits that can come off and fly off mm. the whole point is that mm. the car could easily disintegrate into tiny little pieces and hit someone on the back of the head right or hit mm. someone on the head 2001 i think jack villeneuve and ralph had a massive accident right where the car actually flew into the wall took off into the wall and the piece of um uh debris that came off the car went straight over the barriers and hit a marshal which killed him so the idea well, is is that it stops doing that it helps the, the car will disintegrate if it needs to to protect the driver but it won't fly into tiny tiny little pieces that mm. can easily hurt someone is that done by using some kind of mesh or something uh i don't know it's just more the, the fact that there's no sort of this is the thing this is why i probably want to look at it a lot more in depth but um it's done with because if you look at like sort of the front wing end plates the end plates are just like a little piece that have been put on to a front wing mm -hmm. And just easily, you just easily catching it can flick it off. It won't take the whole wing off, but it will fling off. So, like Hamilton did in Emilio Magno, it was just a tiny little piece, but it came off. So, it's to stop that. So, maybe it's more about making it more structurally sound. So, if it does break off, a whole part breaks off. So. Mm. But we'll um, have to check, wait and yeah. see. Check, check your email now, mate. Then you can use that ones I've said. Right. Especially the logo because it's a high res version. Because that version you've got isn't high res. Don't know why. I don't know where you got that one from. But anyway, we'll just try the overlay first. See if that what it looks like. Right. Should make it a bit, bit more uh, just to make it think. Because obviously we've got Premier League at the moment. We don't want that for F1, do we? Yeah, some good, <clears throat> some uh, some good games on tonight. Tottenham, Southampton, Villa City. When's the next F one race? Actually, it's uh, it's next. When is it? It's next. I'm glad you did that because the F one was um. Yeah, so what's the next uh, what's the next uh, race F1? Actually, sorry, go back. Sorry, I'm going to go back. Uh, when's the next F1 race? It's next. Uh, it's uh, uh, not next week. It's the week after. It's, uh, Where is it's, it at? it's the week. Uh, yeah, it's the weekend after. It's uh, it's uh, uh Port Portugal, Portimao. It should be a dry race then. 
it should be. I'll also put that F11 in there just in case I just want to use it on that one. Uh, but yeah, uh, so yeah, you sent us this one in. You so just just want to see it for dimensions, mate. That's perfect. Yeah. Boom! Look at that, people. Boom! <laughs> just need to replace the background now with the F1 background and. Um, yeah, 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 man. And we're 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 way, boy. But uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we'll be doing next week a lot more. If anyone does want to come on and have their their say about, it, obviously it's difficult to talk about. Uh, I might. I, I don't know whether to mix it up. Actually, uh, if people, if there's anyone in particular people want me to do, DM me. Um, of course, you are a Mercedes fan. Let's be let's be honest here. Do you think that that terrible accident made Mercedes? Do you think after that uh, uh, terrible accident that made Mercedes leave in '55, Fangio did dominate at Ferrari as he won season of '90? I wouldn't say he did. He, he didn't. He didn't. Um, he didn't really dominate. It was it, like I said, the car wasn't great to start with, so it, it wasn't really dominating. It was just. It, it was more his talent, being able to get the best out of what he had, uh, and still managing and see it, realizing what the problems needed to improve. So, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously Mercedes pulled out afterwards. I mean. Look, like I said, I'm I'm supporting Mercedes because I support Hamilton, right? If that Hamilton left, uh, I would probably and Russell came in. Yeah, okay, I still back Mercedes because Russell's there. Uh, if Russell went to Ferrari, I'd back Ferrari. I'd back the driver because in the end, uh, it's the the the, the the it's it's the driver that wins yeah, that that wins their own driver's title, right? For their country. So yeah, me, I back the driver. But there you go. Mm. Obviously, for Italy fan, uh, fans from Italy, those um, Ferrari fans, they just back their their, their team. Obviously, but uh, me, I I back my driver. So there we go. But uh, yeah, anything you want to say? Uh, talk before we go. Uh, no, I just I mean Ferrari. I was a wild one. Ferrari, when, when I was a kid, whenever you see the see the, 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 the Formula One, Ferrari was one that always stuck out to me. I don't know why, it just did. Um, I'm only open, all, I only go to Red Bull if my favourite driver goes there. So if Russell went to Red Bull and fucking fucked over Verstappen, right, <laughs> then I'd go there. But, or if Lando like, did it, but uh, unless, it, unless that, no. Hey, that's the thought. Who are you gonna who are you gonna back if if Lewis decides to? It's between retire? Lewis and then it's between um, Russell and Lando. Oh. It is between them two. One of them two, or probably both. Probably Russell, because mm -hmm. probably Russell will take Hamilton's seat, unless McLaren have an absolute madness with the rules. But mm. we'll have to wait and see. Uh, also, people, we're at uh, 933 subscribers now. So are we? Come on. Yes. Oh, I'm talking to Tur Turkish this morning on his channel. Huh. Yeah. Are we 933 subs? Yep. Big up everyone who has. Please, please. And big up everyone who has already, by the way. Everyone who has. Please, please do share it on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Like, it's sick. It's 67 away. 67 now. 66. Come on. 66. Come on. Right. I know it's a great year for me as a British artist, as an English fan. Right. 19, sorry, 934 says Anthony. Thanks for the uh, update, Anthony. Yeah, 600. No, 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 no. 
938. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what? <laughs> 938, my friend. Big, big Boom. up, big up, big up. Right? Oh, close. Uh, keep, keep sharing it and keep getting people to subscribe, right? Because you are going to get the best content for F1 here, I am sure you. Right, you will get the best content here because we could go in, we can go into level whoa, depths whoa, whoa. of detail that not whoa. many fans whoa, whoa. can go into. Yeah, it's cool, man. Right, keep it real, man. Keeping it real. We keep it real. We know what we're talking about, right? And as for the football, like I said, I follow Arsenal, but I won't love them the way I used to. Simple Until like things change. Until things and, change. Yeah, until well, until I mean, this, listen, until this only leaves. Let, me this. let me say this. Let me say this in terms of the football for all clubs. It's just at the end of the day, you know, our clubs are a are a, are a, an ongoing concern for whomever buys into them. We only have, we can only ever take their word that they're going to do the best by the club. That's all you can ever do. If they don't do that and they try and do something like this, then it's not the actual. It's not our club. It is just individuals. With deep pockets, they were trying to make their pockets. I know. Whoa. Look at that dedication, look. Yeah, that's it. I knew a lot already, but look at me. Mm. All day I've done that. We got a printer. <laughs> no, that's me writing it out. You should got a printer. You should type and print it out. Nah, what's the point? We oh, voice. Out, we got... we? Don't you use a voice record? Use a voice. I uh, think you can just you can say it and it will. Put it in and you print it. No, do you know why? Because I have a I have a special pen that uh, records audio. I had it for um uh, uni forty one year at uni. I had because I missed the second point when I'm writing stuff down, right? Because my ASD, right mm. now because my encyclopedia. I have a uh, a pen where you record the audio whilst you're writing. Mm. Um, so you recording basically. You're basically recording what the uh, tutor is saying. Uh, well, yeah, I mean it can be dodgy because I remember once seeing into it. Uh, it was no, nah, because you ask him, you ask him, and they, they the 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 that no the 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 your DSA gives lets you get uh, buys it uh, by your DSA dispute sport allowance buys it for you, mm. gives you the money to go and get well, it. So the put universities approve universities approve it. Mm. I, I I said uh, sneak and follow up in one of my things and when I printed it out it, it said sneeze and follow through. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it well I'm yesterday. You're such a twat. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a prick. <laughs> we'll leave it uh, out there, man. Oh, but yeah, there leave it out, leave it there. But you know yeah, what? follow through with your uh, sub, my people. Follow up Look, also. Yes, please do subscribe. Right now, um, who do you want me to do? I'm gonna, do you know what? I'm gonna leave a tweet out there. My F1 Legends episode two. Who do you want me to do? I think you should probably give some info in terms of the first driver. I think that'd be quite useful for new fans, existing fans, you know, fans who are thinking about getting more interested in it because at the end of the day. The more knowledge, the better. It's a fair. So, um, now nah, do you know what? I know what you know? I know what I want to do next year. I want to do. I know what I want to do next time. I think I know my next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll speak about that later with everyone. Because I've got stuff. I I I'll just literally say this. Like, um, I know someone who is a mechanic on their car, and they've got a load of stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's signed and stuff from him. Yeah, we'll, we'll put it to the. Let's say we'll put it to the team. I'll say that. We'll put it, yeah, we'll put it to the team. We'll discuss about it. But I think I know, might know who I want to do. But we'll wait and see. I might do one good, one old like we just did there. So I thought it was best to start off at the start. And yeah, then, you, like you, one more you, like mental sort of era, something like that. Yeah. Uh, well, you've yeah, got to go, but, you've got to, you know, you've got to go for, you know, your, your, your Nicky Lauders and Hunt and all that. I think definitely, well. I, I think Nicky, actually, do you know what? I like, no. Nicky Lauder a better one because people still know it today because of his Mercedes. Because hmm. of all this. Hmm. So, and everyone knows because he bought Hamilton to Mercedes. So, I might actually do him. Do you know what? Actually, no. Next week, episode two, I might have said three and a start. But no, do you know what? Episode two, 
we are doing Nicky Lauda. Mm. Right? I know it's been dramatized in the film, but we're gonna go try and spend and uh, try and squeeze it into an hour talking about Nicky Lauda. Because yeah. that is one of the most amazing stories ever. And it's a shame he's no longer with us, but there you go. Uh but yeah, um uh, anyway, um uh, thanks for everyone that's tuned in as usual. Do hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. We are so close. Yes. Please go and do it yes. now. Yes, right? yes, yes, Especially yes, yes. if you want to find the best place for your F1 content. It's right here. We all know what we're doing. So and lots of other lots of other ideas coming as well. It's, and it's loads of ideas. Coming. We've got new shows coming up. Eight o'clock tonight. Wonder Kid Watch. I don't know whether we're gonna talk about one or two players during this stream or just give you a sort of an intro of what the streams could be about. But uh I think well, we'll actually, people about, can I think actually, no, do you know what? I think we're gonna talk about a couple of players. Right. People can but, actually get, get the get the gist of what it is that we're gonna be doing. So we're gonna do a yeah, so we're gonna do a couple of players but to get the gist of ideas. But it's it's but we'll, well it, 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 explain it, it later, mate. Yeah, we'll 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 go for it, but I think we can we can get a couple of players to talk about. Mm. I think we can. It's only for like an hour or so. So but there. When we've got half the pressure as usual, obviously talk about the new format for the Champions League 2024, plus the complete collapse of the fucking European Super League. Go fuck yourself. Oh, in terms of... Total disaster that thing was. I know. You know my milk right, I've good. got milk in the fridge. I've got milk in the fridge that I bought before all that and and it's still good. So my milk lasted longer than a fucking the European Super League. Honestly. I know that shit. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to mention milk. Right, end it there. <laughs> <laughs> end it there before we get onto curtains and all. You know. Oh, shut right. up. Oh, wow, shut people. Up. Thanks for watching. Oh, thanks for tuning in. Everyone. Yeah, yeah. They're just ignoring him. He's just being a knob. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for everyone that's tuned in. Uh, we'll speak to you guys uh, at 6 p.m. with the Heart of the Press show. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.